empathy and empathy have on couples whose habit is bickering? Yeah. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's really nothing that I find more excruciating. And I'm not comparing this to, you know, people who belt each other, you know, but I don't know about you, but I have zero tolerance for bickering because you have a desire to be right, okay? So you have a desire to be heard. You have a desire for respect. You have a desire for all of that. But by bickering, you've lost any possibility of being treated with respect or having anyone hear you. And that's the key. Bickering just doesn't work. Because if I say the sky's blue and you say, no, it's gray, and nobody's bothered to look out the window, for example, you know, we're not going to compromise. There's no possibility of enlightening the other person. You simply have to say, ah, so, you know, it sounds as if I looked out the window when the sky was blue, and then it, probably the clouds came in, and now the sky's gray, and that's why you think it's gray and I think it's blue. Does that make sense to you, Bob? And Bob would say, yeah, probably. I was like, well, okay, and this is fast forward to solution. Uh, through a request or offer, a solution is found. So Bob, should we go over to the window together and see? And then maybe we look at the, out the window and it's a little blue and a little gray, then I might say, you know what, let's walk out the front door, let's walk out onto the lawn, and maybe then we can look around the whole sky and we'll see what's happening with clouds, etc. Just common sense. How to find a calm solution that works for both of you means that at least one of you needs to learn self-empathy to calm yourself down and empathy to calm the other person down. That's a wonderful example, Susan. I wish I'd heard that years ago, personally. Thank you. Are these the, the most powerful skills that you teach for reconciliation because I know that your success rate is 99% even if one partner does have these skills. Yeah, I mean, this works all the time. So if I've been teaching you skills that work all the time, you don't need other skills, right? However, you do need to learn these skills and it can take quite some time. If you're someone who's used to living on an emotional roller coaster, it's going to take you time to learn this instead because we're creating an alternative brain for you. We're changing your brain wiring. That's a big deal. Now, if you're an IT person or a web developer person, then you would understand if I said to you, we're developing a second website for you and it's we're not showing it yet, and then it, when it's fine and it's perfect and it's wonderful, then we're gonna switch it out and that's gonna be the website everybody's gonna see. We're two parallels that you've been developing, one the pre-existing, one the new one. But in thinking and communication, it's even more complicated because in the thinking and communication, little by little, you're improving the way you think, you improve the way you listen, you improve the way you speak, and you improve the way you act. And little by little, people start to behave differently because they feel that you're more peaceful and more compassionate. Perfect formula. Susan, I know that you work with many families to transform the kinds of addiction. What is the value of self-empathy and empathy in those difficult family challenges that affect our loving relationships? Well, we've done a lot of shows on addiction, so I don't want to go into too much detail, except the clip that we showed you from Mrs. Gary is, you know, the intervention. So the bottom line is, and I'm kidding but not kidding, what is it that would have kept that woman in a bathrobe in her house for so long that her friends would have done an intervention? Well, if you've watched our show and you've watched previous episodes of Mrs. Gary, which is Mrs. Gary TV on YouTube as well, then you'll know her husband used to have a big job as a producer and then he didn't want to do that anymore and he became a knife sharpener and they had to give up all of the luxury and all the glamour. So she's pretty much shell-shocked. 
So if you want to get this woman out of a robe and keep her out of a robe, because you saw at the end of the show where she went basically running back, you know, and you know she's going to be in a robe in five minutes. You've got to give her empathy for her fear because her need for financial respect isn't met from all of her friends who have so much money. You know that she feels really heartbroken because her need for a fun, glamorous life isn't met. You know she feels very angry because her need for consideration wasn't met when her husband decided, well, I'm just giving up Hollywood and I'm going to become a knife sharpener. And if you think about it, you can think of another 20 or 30 feelings and unmet needs she has. And if you want to make a list of those and send them to me in an email, I'll be sure to steer you in the right direction if you, if you get lost. But its bottom line is people who are addicted in any way, and obviously drug addiction and alcohol addiction and all the other AA addictions is a far more serious than someone who has kind of agoraphobia and lives in a robe. That's terrible, but she's got a roof over her head and she's got a husband who loves her. All these other addictions are very, very dangerous. And people have them because they don't know how to get their needs met. And that's the key. They need self-empathy from you to give to you first. They need you to give them empathy again and again and again until little by little you can encourage them out of this state. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan. I'm curious, what about couples who are separated or they're divorced and they're co-parenting? This would be great for them, wouldn't it? Yeah, the biggest problem that couples have is if you're married or you're a couple and you're living together and you don't get along, you already are in a disaster that's waiting to happen. Now, if you're not living together, you'll just break up. But if you're already living together, you might end up having one or more children. Then you're going to have a custody battle, whether you're married or not. You're going to have a custody battle. And if you have a custody battle, there is nothing more heartbreaking for the children and for each of you than to fight over who gets to see the children when and put a financial number, a dollar number, on child care. It's devastating. So here's where the entire six-part conversation is essential, including, most important, self-empathy. Because if you don't start, by calming yourself down, you're going to be in trouble. There you go. The self-empathy is so number one. How does self-empathy and empathy change the relationship between a partner and a young child? You know, Marshall Rosenberg, who taught me about self-empathy and empathy, he's the founder of uh, the Center for Nonviolent Communication, and he just passed away last month. And he used to make a joke about the most horrifying thing that a child could ever say to a parent. And these children, how could they do it? And they said it all the time, the word no. So what do you do when you have a child who says no? If the child's small enough, you may be confused and think you can force them out of it. But wait till that child becomes a teenager. When they outweigh you, when they're taller than you, when they don't ever have to come home if home is not a wonderful place for them to be. So your only hope, the only hope a parent has, it's like training an elephant. The only hope in having a child is like training an elephant because you have to train them when they're very small. You have to be good to them when they're very small and kind to them when they're very small. Because if you're not, well, there are stories of rogue elephants and people didn't survive in their presence, right? And the same thing is true with teenagers. Though, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to be violent, but they will certainly be impossible to control. So you must use empathy. When you motivate a child to get out of bed to go to school, when you motivate them to set their own alarm and wake themselves up, when you motivate them to make their own lunch if they keep complaining about yours, or motivate them to do their homework because they're getting in trouble at school. All the different things that kids have challenges with. 
and that as a parent you may have, before you watch this show, thought that you could just tell them what to do and force them to do it, I am reminding you that's a very dangerous strategy. So please avoid that. Great reminder. Now what about with teenagers? Does it make a difference in those terrible teenage years? Well, I know I just see we have to, we have about ten minutes, so we can can uh, really discuss the whole family thing in detail. So whatever relationship you have, that's basically what I'm saying. If you have a relationship with a partner, if you have a relationship with a baby, a small child, a teenager, the same thing is really true. And there are certain times when it's more crucial than others. If you want to have a loving relationship, you know, don't think that you can get away with bickering and it's not going to pay a price. You're not going to pay a price. Of course you will. And if you have a relationship with a child and you love that child, don't think that you can argue with them without having the relationship pay a price. It will. So the key is that what I'm teaching you about loving long-term relationships is exactly the same model. Tonight we're talking about self-empathy and empathy. And in future shows we'll talk about the other parts of the six-part conversation. Self-expression, reflection, clarification. Thank you, Fred, for, for all the things you put up on the board. And solution. And all of these make it possible for you not only to have a loving relationship, but for you to have every relationship. Is there any question you think of? Because, you know, I could talk forever, so no worries. Oh, absolutely. Well, the importance of the self-empathy and then for people to really, really pay attention to what they need. How can they get to that focus as quickly as possible? That's great. You know, and Marshall Rosenberg used to say that people just don't have a needs vocabulary, which I certainly have found to be true. That if you're in a relationship with a partner, a life partner, you, you're human. So you have, and it doesn't matter to me if this is number one on your list or number 10 on your list, but please make a note so you know and, and ask your partner as well. And I have a wonderful quiz. So if you want to send me an email, there's a wonderful quiz I can send you too. And the needs list, well, you have a physical body. So you have a need for physical safety. You have a need for financial stability or financial security. You have a need for affection. If it's a partner who you're living with, then it's probable that you have a need for passion. You may have a need for monogamy. You certainly have a need for health. You have a need either to make a difference or to do something for an income that you enjoy. So making a difference, having an interesting career, having a purpose, a life purpose, all of these things you know, go hand in hand. And you can drill down and you can expand this list to a hundred different needs that you have. And when I work with couples who are looking for that soulmate, that wonderful life partner, I remind them that they have to make it a huge list, that the bigger the list is, the faster you're going to meet that partner, not the other way around. Because if you make a list with just 10 needs on it, then billions of people could meet those needs, and then you're going to be discouraged because if the first 10 don't meet enough of your needs, you're going to say, oh, there's nobody there. Nobody like that exists. I'll never find him. I've been on Match.com. I've been on eHarmony. I'm barking up an impossible tree. But if you make a long, long list and you're really focused and you're really intent, you may understand it may take a while for this person to materialize and you're not going to lose your temper. You're not going to feel hopeless in a short period of time. And if you feel triggered, remember, self-empathy. And when you write your profile, remember, write an empathetic one. And when somebody contacts you, remember the emails. They all have to be empathetic. And when you agree to speak on the phone, remember, empathy. And when you're getting dressed for that date, remember, self-empathy, because you're going to be freaking out maybe or 
concern maybe, or if you see that person across the crowded room and you're not quite thrilled, self-empathy, so you can walk over to the table and empathize with this person. The worst thing is, at least you're getting practice. If this is not your soulmate, if this is not your life partner, at least you're practicing. That's wonderful, Susan. I know you have really had success with that as well, the loving relationship connection. Yeah, I'm working with a lot of women right now, all in their 30s, who are looking for the life relationship that they want to have for the rest of their life. And it's really, really interesting. It's really, really interesting. And uh, I love, of course, I love helping people with any kind of relationship. It's really fun to work with. These are three young, beautiful women who are available. And we're working on how to find not any old partner, not the wrong partner, but great partners for each of them. And it's really exciting as they create their needs lists, as they master self-empathy and empathy and self-expression and all the rest of it. Wonderful. Some successful relationships are in the making. Yeah. Yeah. Great formula. Yeah. I'm curious now what the difference is, the difference that self-empathy and empathy make in an empty nest syndrome when couples really are finally the family is living alone and without their children. Is this a very challenging adjustment? I would imagine so. Yeah, you know, there's so many divorces. They're called gray divorces. When people over a certain age, over 50, get divorced, it's called a gray divorce, I implying that people still have gray hair. Not so many of us do, but <laughs> you know what I mean. And so the point about the empty nest syndrome is for 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, you've been too busy to think straight, too busy with your children, too busy with getting them to school, too busy with making them lunch, helping them with homework, driving them to this game and that game and dance lessons and piano lessons and all that. Now they're in high school. Now finally they can drive themselves. So you have a little bit of spare time. And you don't really notice your partner too much because you're making up for lost time. But when all the kids are in college, or they're out of school, they're out of college, and they're now living on their own, now too many couples take a look at each other across from the dining table at night and say, what in the world am I doing here? Now, if your partner has that look, you better be great at self-empathy and empathy, don't you think? Because you don't want a gray divorce, let us say. If you're the one who's frustrated, irritated, angry, disappointment, and you, you know, disappointed, you think the only hope is to get out of there, then gee, give yourself self-empathy before you make any unexpected moves. If you're the one who's getting the critical looks across the table, you absolutely need these skills. It's really important. Thank you, Susan. A wonderful way to help people to create the loving relationship that I'm sure so many of us really want in our lives. And I think that the key is most people that call me for a free session really have assumed it's hopeless. And it's amazing to me, the pervasiveness of hopelessness. It's amazing to me. I, I wasn't the happiest girl in the world, but I never felt things were hopeless. You know, I always figured if I got to learn something, I could do better. If I got to learn something else, I could have better results. And I always assumed everyone saw it that way. And tragically, they don't. I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of you who contacted me over the years, and you honestly cannot believe that all these other people are turning their lives around, that all these other people have gotten their spouses not only not to leave them and divorce them, but actually be happy with them and love them and feel passionate and excited about them. And those are the people that I wish I could reach because hopelessness is not only a miserable, miserable, miserable life sentence, but it isn't even true. You know, it's, it's a tragedy. 
That's very encouraging, Susan, that they can turn it around and have Anybody a more wonderful can. life. Anybody can. There's not a single person who can't turn around their life today, whatever it is. And, you know, I'm sure you wish that you were in a better place than you are. Doesn't everybody have goals? That's called a goal. But if you have a goal and you haven't reached it yet, that's looking in a positive way towards the future, being willing to take action. If you're sitting where you are and you refuse to look at your goals because you've decided they're hopeless, you've lost the game even before you started because you're just not playing the game at all. You're not on the field. And that has to be shifted. You must shift that. Thank you, Susan. That's very encouraging and anybody can go forward with this. And we're always a choice, regardless of the outside influences with self-empathy and empathy skills. We can indeed always create wonderful relationships if we choose to master and use these skills. And I'd just like to remind you to remember that Susan does offer one hour complimentary telephone session to show you how to do this. So success is on the way. And now I'd like to reflect that Susan Allen writes a column in the Ask the Love and Relationship Coach in the Santa Barbara Family Life magazine. And this is available online. That's www.sbfamilylife.com.